Okay, so I got a bunch of requests to look at this video, so I'm looking at this video, and here I am. So this is actually from, uh, it, well, I didn't first see it from the Ohio State University Marching Band, but apparently it is. So check out this guy, uh, BT Dubs, I used to be drum major also, but not this good, I was terrible. Okay, so he's twirling this baton, he throws it, it hits the ground, and it bounces back, and it looks epic. Okay, so let's see if we can figure out what's going on. I'm gonna break this into uh, different parts. So here's part one. He's throwing the baton. You can't really see it too well, but there's the baton. And I'm gonna model this baton. Is it called a baton? Is it something else? I don't know. So there it is. Uh, it's two masses with a stick in between it. It's moving that way uh, with some speed, velocity vector V. And then it's also rotating. Okay, the rotation is important. Okay, the next part is right here where the baton collides with the ground. There it is, you can't really see it in the frame. I would have thought they would have put it in the frame. Nothing like encouraging a conspiracy theory by showing the important part not, in, or not including the important part in the video frame. But I'm pretty sure it's real. Okay, I didn't test if it's real or not. I did not do a video analysis. I don't think it's necessary too much at this point. But the important thing is that when it contacts with the ground, there are two forces acting on it. First, there's the upward force from the ground. We would call that the normal force. Uh, I'm calling it Fn, it's pushing up. Uh, and then there's, a, there's gonna be a backwards pushing friction force. I assume, I assume that this is, it looks like AstroTurf, rubber with AstroTurf, which is really useful because that's a little bit more I think if it was like real grass, it would kind of dig in and stuff and wouldn't work as well. Um, but but again, I, I'm just kind of speculating here. I don't really know very much about the actual situation. And then, so those two forces uh, do two things. The net force, we can use the momentum principle that says the force changes the momentum. So, so those two forces, one's going to change its momentum to make it bounce up. And this friction force can make it slow down, maybe even reverse directions. That's what we want. Okay, and then we, there's also uh, gonna be the angular momentum principle. Both these forces will exert a torque which could change the angular velocity because you'll notice right here at the, in step one, it's rotating one way and it comes back, it's rotating, it's right there. It's moving that way. My video camera's backwards. Uh, and it's rotating the other way. Okay, and he catches it. I, I really imagine like how much would he have to practice to get this to work? I don't know. But let's, let's move on. And this is a quote that I made because I have my name down there, right? Rat Elaine, that's me. And you don't really understand something until you can model it, unless you can model it. So I want to model this stick, this bouncing stick, and see if we can get a similar um, output in the model to real life. Then, I mean, that doesn't mean that it's real. That doesn't mean that you completely understand it. But if you can't model it, then you probably can't understand it. Let's start again with the momentum principle. I'm going to show you the quickest introduction to numerical calculations in Python. I'm going to fly through stuff because I don't think you want to watch a 30 minute video, but I would do it for you. Okay, I've got videos on that. So let's start with the momentum principle. This says that the net force on an object is the change in momentum with respect to time. And we write, I'm going to write that as a finite difference instead of a derivative uh, because that's important later. And momentum is, in this case, mass and velocity. So it's just mv. I'm going to break the motion into small time intervals, delta t. So delta t is small. That's important. And how small is small depends on your situation. A small time interval here would be extremely small for orbital motion, which would have huge time intervals. But that's a different story. So if I do that, I can look at the momentum at the beginning of the time interval and the end of the time interval. So instead of writing delta P, I'm going to say P2, the final momentum, minus P1. So that's the change in momentum. And I can solve that for P2. So if I just multiply both sides by delta T, add P1, I get P2, the final momentum, is the initial momentum, P1, plus the net force times delta T. And notice force is a vector delta t is a scalar, multiply those together, and you still get a vector. So that is good. Okay, now we also have the definition of average velocity. This is technically average velocity, but again, in, in, and I didn't point this out. Why can you do that momentum thing? Well, I can do that because my time interval is short. I can assume that the force is constant. 
even if it's not. Because over a short time interval, it's kind of constant. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. And the same thing's true here. This is the average velocity where I'm using R to represent the position of an object. Uh, so the average velocity is the change in position with respect to time. I can again look at the position at the beginning and the end of the time interval and solve for the final position. It's the same equation, delta over delta. So I get the final position R2 is the initial position R1 plus the velocity, and you'll notice I put P2, 2 over M times delta T. So P over M would be the velocity. And now I'm using P2 because I just found the final momentum. So again, I'm assuming the momentum is constant during this time interval, and I'm using uh, the momentum at the end of the time interval. You technically can use the momentum at the beginning of the time interval. You can technically find the average, okay? Uh, but this just turns out to be computationally efficient, and it works really well. So if it works, you know, it works. And so this, there's better numerical recipes. This is the simplest one. I like simple. Simple's good. Okay, so here we have this just review the update the momentum. We're going to use the force and update the momentum, and then we're going to update the position. And then we're going to do it again, right? That was just for one short time interval. If I want a longer time interval, I'm going to have to do that again. Um, now, there is one other thing. I do need to calculate the force. And let's start off with just a gravitational force. So there's a gravitational force pulling it down. It's m times g. g is the gravitational field. g has a value of 0, negative 9.80 newtons per kilogram. So that's that. Okay. I don't, if I wanted to break this into a time interval of 1 1,000th one of a second, and I want to I model one second of time, that's a thousand of these steps. And I don't want to do that. Okay, so I'm going to have a computer do it. And you should too. So this is my entire program for this. I'm going to change this program. So I'm just starting off with this. I'm using uh, Web v Python. Uh, it's free online Python that has a bunch of modules built in to animate stuff. And I'm not going to go into all the details. I'm going to go into just some of the details. Did I? No, I didn't. Okay. So here, let's just put, can you see, uh, in line three right there is my, is my gravitational field. This is just a box so that I can make it act like a ground and have the, the ball as a sphere. Okay. And then I give them it a mass. Ball 1.m is the mass. I just picked a mass. And then I gave it a momentum, mass, and velocity. I gave it a velocity vector. And then I have a time and a time step. And then down here, you see I have this loop. I, and that loop goes through each of those, those calculations and just keeps doing it as long as the time is less than 1. So this calculates the force, which I don't need to do because it doesn't change, but I'm just I'm going to do it later. And then I update the momentum in line 17 right there and update the position of the ball in line 18, update time in 19, do it over again. Now, a quick note, if you've not done a, a program before, which is fine, I'm not, I'm not saying you have to, um, this line looks like it shouldn't work. It looks like the momentum would cancel, but it doesn't because it's not an equation. It's a make equal to thing. It's, it's not equal sign in Python means uh, make this equal, not it is equal to. Right, so it takes the old momentum and it makes a new one. That way you don't have to worry about all the P1, P2, P3, P4. It's just P. I'm just going to change P, ball 1.P. Okay. So if I do that, I can actually run it. And this is what I get. There's my ground. There's my ball. I made a trail. And, and it did what you would think, right? I gave it some initial velocity. It moved. But it, it didn't bounce. It didn't hit the ground because I never told it how to do that, right? I'm just, it's just a ball going through the air. There's no ground. The ground's just an animated object. There's no there's nothing there. So we need to we need to add that in there. Now there's a couple ways you could do this. My personal favorite is springs. So imagine the ball collides with the floor and it actually extends into the floor or maybe the floor bends or maybe the ball bends or maybe the floor and the ball bend together. But either way, imagine that that is a spring between the ball and the floor and it compresses some amount s. And if I find that compression amount s, then I can, I can calculate the force that that floor pushes back up on the ball uh, just using the Hooke's law, which calculates the force due to a spring. So that means there's an upward pushing force, and it's k, which is the spring constant, times s, the amount that it's compressed. The more you compress it, the greater that force. And then y hat is a unit vector pushing up. Um, 
because you have to have it as a vector, right? You have to have a force as a vector. So I need that y hat there. And in this case, y hat's perpendicular to the surface. Since I have a flat surface, I just put y hat. You could calculate that in other ways, but I'm just going to say flat. Okay. So let's put this in our program. So what's, what's new here? Okay, the new thing is right here. I'll put a box around it. So I have KF. That's the spring constant for the floor. So it says it's 1,000 newtons per meter. Every time you compress it, a meter, that's 1,000 newtons, which is kind of high. It's a pretty stiff spring, but I want it to be kind of stiff. And you can change that. That's something that you should definitely change. And I'm going to give you a version of this code that's a little messy, but you're just going to have to deal with that. Uh, and then S is the... Okay, I made a little mistake right here. Uh, S is the S is the distance between the center of the ball and the center of the ground. Okay, because the way Python says positions, it, it uses the center. And I want to make them overlap. So I want to calculate that distance between the center of the ball to the bottom and then from the center of the box, the middle of it. And that's what this is. That's what that S is. So I, I shouldn't have called it S in the previous one. Okay, right here, I count. Okay, so in my loop, what I, I'm not going to always have that spring force, only if they overlap. So what I'm going to do is to, every time I get back to the beginning of the loop, I'm going to set that FF, which is the force due to the floor, to zero, the zero vector. And then I'm going to calculate the distance between the ball and the center. Okay, and then if it's, if it's compressed at all, then I'm going to calculate the force and I'm going to set it equal to zero. So every time I start back over with the zero force and then I calculate what it should be. And that's what I do right there. And then the rest is the same. The only difference is in line 23, I actually do also add the total force F1, which is the force in ball one, is M times G plus that force to the floor. Okay, so let's look and see what happens now. Pretty happy with this turn, the way this turned out, right? You could, you could see if energy is conserved. You could see if momentum is conserved in the x direction, all the stuff, and it should be. I didn't do that. Um, and you could, I've seen people just do bouncing balls where they just say, if the ball is at the floor, change the y momentum. And that works, but this one's a little bit better because it gives us the value of that force. We're going to need the value of that force in the next part. Okay, so here's what we have. We have the ball collides with the ground and there's an upwards pushing force. I like to do this. Okay. And the ball's moving that way. So in a sense, the ball's sliding on the floor, right? And so if it's sliding on the floor, we can say there's a backwards pushing, I did it, backwards pushing friction force. Okay. And so that's what I wanna add. I wanna add this frictional force uh, in when it's colliding with the ground. You have to have that in order for that baton to come back, right? There has to be a force that stops it and accelerates it back this way. Um, okay, so the friction, the model for friction this is just a model. Friction is very complicated. Uh, is going to be some coefficient of friction, mu sub k, times the magnitude of the normal force. This is a scalar equation, right? Because the normal force is this way, and the friction force, yeah, I'm doing it right now, is that way. Okay, the friction force pushes backwards that way. I'm going to get used to pointing in the opposite direction so I can get this right. Okay, so let's make, uh, let's add this friction model into our code here. Uh, so what's important right here, I, I don't show you the whole program right here. Uh, that's not my coefficient. I just called it mu. I set it low to 0.1. Um, I dare tell you what rate does. Yeah, so rate is, up here just says, tells WebVPython, it says, don't do more than a thousand loops per second. And if I have a time step of one one thousandth, this would run in real time. Okay, so now I have my force, floor for, force set to zero. I also have my friction force set to zero. And then if they overlap, I need to calculate both of those. So first I'm gonna calculate the force from the floor, which I did before. And you notice this vector zero, one, zero, that's my Y hat. Uh, and then I'm going to calculate the friction force is negative mu times the magnitude of F1 times, now this right here, this norm ball one dot P dot X. So norm ball one dot P gives me a unit vector magnitude one in the direction. Ooh, that's not what I wanted. That doesn't really work right because I'm just trying to think. 
Yeah. So I, I can adjust this, but I think I still, my program still mostly works. This, the X component would not be one. I was thinking it would be just one or negative one. Um, I can just change this, but the key is if it's moving this way, then I want the friction force to be back that way. Okay. And then I multiply by, uh, I'm trying to figure out how to fix this. I could do, I could do this. I could say norm of vector ball one P dot X zero zero. Yeah. Okay. There's another way to do that. There's, there's plenty of ways to do that. And I, I just want to make sure that if I get a situation where the ball is moving backwards, I want the friction force to change direction. That's what I was trying to do. Okay, and then here I have, uh, now I have the force, I have three forces on it, the gravitational force, the backwards pushing friction force, and the upward, upwards pushing floor. And then I update the momentum, update the position, and time, that's it. Okay, so let's see what that looks like. Okay, so you'll notice it's still bouncing, but now each time it bounces less, because when it's bouncing, there's a backwards pushing force that slows it down. And it, it decreases the momentum in that direction. That direction. The for its friction forces that way. Okay, we still don't have our thing. So let's add in another ball and another spring. So now I have my baton. Okay, so how can I model this? I'm gonna say that it's a two masses connected by a spring. And so the spring has some unstretched length of L0. And I'm gonna calculate a vector from one ball to the other is a vector L. And then I can model this spring between these two. It's just, uh, negative k times this, the change in l minus l naught. Uh, so right here I have, I have to do the l naught is just a scalar value. So I have to take the magnitude of l, take the difference of those, and then multiply it by a unit vector l hat. So it goes back into a vector, okay? And then here's the code for that. Uh, I just have two balls now, uh, r, I, I switched back and forth between r1 and r2 and I apologize about that. Um, R2 is, so what I need to do is I need to see if the second ball hits the ground. I need to see if this, I need to calculate the force, the normal force on the second ball, normal for, the friction force of the second ball. So I'm just adding two balls in there. Uh, other than that, I calculate this R, no, L. L is the, the vector between the two balls. Uh, and then I need right here, Fs is the spring force on one of the balls. Now, when I calculate the spring force on one, since it's the same force, I just take the opposite of that for the force on the other ball to that spring. Okay, but here's uh, what I get. I'm pretty happy with this, even though I'm pretty sure it's wrong now because of my little uh, unit vector trick. And you'll notice it, it, it shakes a lot. That's because, you know, I just, it's a simple model. You can fix that by having a larger spring constant uh, so they don't shake so much. Um, and a smaller time step, so you could fix it. But it does it does look pretty pretty nice. Let's I want to play that one more time. Oops, let's play that one more time. Oops, let's play that one more time. Pretty nice, huh? See, it it does what you would think. Okay, so now the one other thing I need to do is to set initial conditions because I want to think about the velocity of the center mass, uh, and then what would be the velocity for one and two. And I think I switched the numbers; those it doesn't really matter. Uh, and then so, and it's also rotating with some angular velocity, which is a vector, okay? Angular velocity is actually a vector. I draw this curved arrow to represent that, but if I, if it's rotating that way, you could use your right hand, this is my right hand, my right hand rule to say that the vector would be coming out of the, out of the screen this way. Uh, and then I need the vector position from the center mass to each, each piece, and I can find the velocity based on the center mass and the angular velocity. So the velocity of one would just be the velocity of the center mass uh, plus this rotational velocity, which is negative R1 cross omega. So you take the cross product and you can get it. And, and that's just a little trick. Um, you could do omega cross R1 and not have the negative sign, but you know, it wasn't thinking. I just did it when I did it. And so if I do that, if I do that, now I can give the stick, instead of just starting with the initial velocity moving that way, I can make it rotate and reproduce something similar to what happens in the video. And here we go. And I, I played around with initial conditions, and this is in slow motion. Uh, but you can see that it does bounce back, right? It didn't do bounce back super great. And I think it might be my friction force. I'm pretty sure it is. Because the faster it goes, no. The, the greater the downward velocity, it would have less friction, which is weird. But, but it works. So I win. I modeled it. I'm not as good as that guy that, that did the trick, but you know, the key is that you can take these things using springs and simple forces. You can pretty much build a model of anything 
Hope you like that. I'm done. If you have any questions, you know, though, down below, I, I usually do reply. So talk to you guys later.